Dr. Ryan. Hassan is a thoracic surgeon and assistant professor of surgery at Dartmouth Hitchcock Medical Center. Ooh, that's old. I should say the Cancer Center. My apologies. Mm -hmm. And the Geisel School of Medicine at Dartmouth, and she serves as the Dartmouth's the director of Dartmouth's Lung Cancer Screening Program. She obtained her medical degree from the uh, Keck School of Medicine at U University of Southern California, and recently she completed her MPH at Dartmouth, Masters of Public Health at Dartmouth, that is. Prior to coming to Dartmouth, she traveled to the East Coast and she trained at Brigham and Women's Hospital where she completed her general surgery training. She also completed cardiothoracic residency at the Ohio State University. And finally, she had additional training with the Mayo Clinic. She joined Dartmouth in 2018 and we're just so pleased that she's with us. And then Dr. King, who I believe will be joining with joining the program a little bit later, is from the University of Vermont. And he obtained his medical degree from the University of Rochester School of Medicine. And he traveled to the South where he completed his residency at Duke University in Durham, North Carolina. But he stayed in North Carolina to complete his Master's of Public Health at the University of North Carolina at Chapel Hill. And then he traveled North and he's been with the University of Vermont since 2003. He's been a professor of family medicine since 2013, and he's leading the effort of this lung cancer uh, program for the University of Vermont. And we're just so thrilled to have both Dr. King and Dr. Hassan with us today. So just a few quick reminders before we get started. Um, we're muting folks, and we're also turning off video cameras because that helps with our bandwidth, especially for those folks who might be in rural parts of Vermont or New Hampshire. If you have any questions, we really welcome them. If you could please drop them into the chat, just type in your questions. We're monitoring them and there are a group of three people who are monitoring your questions. Um, and so we'll have our question and answer session after the PowerPoint presentation. And finally, I'd like to thank my colleagues, Reggie Cooper of Dartmouth and Rachel Narkowitz of UVM who are helping to make this program possible for us today. So over to you, Ryan. We are so excited to hear what you have to say. Okay. Well, thank you so much for having me today. Um, this is a topic that is near and dear to my heart and to which I exert all of my research efforts to, to try to help get patients enrolled in screening. So I hope this provides you with a lot of important information. Please, as Lisa stated, ask whichever questions you have. Dr. King and I are more than happy to answer them. And hopefully you'll walk away with some important information that could either save your life or those of a friend or a family member. So without further ado, I'll go ahead and get started. I do not have any disclosures. So lung cancer is the leading cause of cancer death, both in Vermont and across the United States, and it has been for quite some time. Uh, it's actually the number one killer, um, cancer killer, and it kills more patients than breast and colon cancer combined. Um, there is a painless and uh, low-risk screening tool available to help detect it early so that we can treat it early. Um, it's called a low-dose CT scan. Unfortunately, though, participation in screening is quite low, especially when we compare it to other cancers, such as breast and colon um, cancer that have established screening mechanisms in place. So... We looked to address this back in 2011. Um, they had a huge trial called the National Lung Screening Trial, which was a multi-institutional uh, randomized study. It included more than 50,000 patients, and it demonstrated that using this low-dose um, lung cancer screening CT was much more superior than just using a plain x-ray, which was what had been in use up until that time. They reported two important findings. Uh, the first one was that there was a 20% lung specific mortality reduction. So that meaning people just specifically with lung cancer saw a 20% reduction in their mortality or death rates from this screening um, tool. And there was also a 6.7% overall mortality reduction in this high risk cohort that they were looking at that underwent low dose CT. And we'll talk about what it specifically means to be high risk in just a second. Um, but in, in other words, it showed a great benefit. 
Um, and as these findings um, became more and more popular and word spread about these, many professional organizations published guidelines recommending that you get this low dose CT scan yearly for patients that meet that high risk category. And that was starting in 2013. So you ask, who are these patients that are high risk? Well, there was three criteria in particular that patients must have, and then some other criteria that they must also follow. The first one is that initially when these guidelines came out, they were looking at patients between the ages of 55 and 77. They were looking at those that were either current tobacco users or had a history of tobacco use within the last 15 years, and that's specifically pertaining to cigarette use. And then they were looking at those those that had at least a 30 pack year history or more. So 30 pack years, that means a pack per day of cigarettes for at least 30 years, or two packs per day for 15 years, half a pack per day for 60 years, any sort of equation that you can get to equaling that 30 pack year history was what they were looking for in terms of eligible patients. Other criteria that they had is that they wanted your life expectancy to be more than three years, known, no other known cancers willing to undergo treatment if they were to find something on the screening, um, low dose screening CT, and then no other major health problems that would prevent treatment. And so these guidelines came into practice um, and centers started enrolling patients to help with the false positive rate, meaning getting a CT scan and there comes back a positive finding. And then we do further work with that positive finding and find out, oops, it's actually just um, an abnormality on your CT and not actually a cancer. They instilled something called the lung rad scoring mechanism, okay? And it's similar if any of the patients within this form have had a mammogram in terms of the scoring. There's four main levels that are applicable to patients, lung rads one, two, three, and four. And they did this to standardize the low dose screening CT so that wherever you went, as long as you were going to what we call an accredited center, your CT scan would be scored the same. People would look at your nodule at one place the same as they do another place. And it would help to decrease that rate of actually having false positives or saying something is actually concerning for cancer when it's not actually a cancer. And so this went into play um, and we started with lung cancer screening, but unfortunately the early days of lung cancer screening were targeted by some misinformation. And specifically within this New England Journal Watch article, the false positive rate that we've been talking about that we were trying so hard uh, to uh, improve on was reported incorrectly at 97%. And so that quickly spread throughout the medical community and, you know, providers were telling patients, hey, you can do this screening mechanism, but there's about a 97% chance we're going to find something and it's actually not going to be a cancer, but we're going to think it is. So as you can imagine, um, both providers and patients were a little bit leery about entering into lung cancer screening. And you can see that that, 90, that rate that was quoted at 97.5%, it was actually supposed to be only 59%, which is still pretty high. But when you look at that large study that they did with those 50,000 patients, that rate was actually 27%. So when you compare something reported as 97% when it's really 27%, that's a huge difference. And you can see why initially patients and providers alike were probably pretty um, leery about participating in lung cancer screening. Well, since that time, there's been a lot of efforts to try to report the correct numbers, and we have also improved in that false positive rate. And so that as recent as 2018, and even currently today, that rate is as low as 15%. Um, and it's quoted between 10 and 15%. So we've done a lot better in terms of decreasing that false positive rate. Here at Dartmouth-Hitchcock, we run anywhere between five and 7%. So over time, we've done a real good job in terms of making those results standardized so that if your test says that there's something there, there's likely something there, but to de also decrease that false positive rate so we're not unnecessarily scaring patients. But there's still some issue with uh, patients participating and we don't get as much participation as we do with breast cancer and colon cancer. 
Nevertheless, we've still continued to try to encourage patients to get screened, and they've looked at the data that we've accumulated over the last 10 years, and they saw that, hey, we have these guidelines in place, they're reaching patients that are starting at the age of 55, and that are smoking 30 packs, you know, have a 30 pack year history, but maybe we should make those guidelines a little bit looser because we're still missing patients. And they saw that patients that are age 50 and above, that was a more appropriate cutoff because it was helping to include those that were getting lung cancer earlier. They also saw that 20 pack year history was also more appropriate as opposed to a 30 pack year history. And because that would include more patients that were getting missed on the lower end. So these are the current guidelines that we have in place now. Um, specifically in terms of your age, it's applicable to patients that are 50 to 80 years old. And I will say that 80 upper limit is for patients that have private insurance or insurance subsidies. When it comes to Medicare and Medicaid, they cover up to age 77. So if you're in that uh, 78 to 80 age group, you may just wanna check with your insurance and make sure that it still applies. But we're covering patients at a younger age, starting at age 50. It's still for patients that currently smoke or have quit within the last 15 years. And now it's for patients that have a 20 pack year smoking history that have been smoking for about 20 years. So we have much um, looser guidelines and it's to help to get all of those patients that were starting um, to get lung cancer in an earlier stage, knowing that if we can treat it earlier, your chances of surviving are better and you also have um, better chances and more options for the treatment that you get. Nevertheless, when we look at where we are today, a large number of patients still aren't getting screened and still aren't participating in this life-saving screening modality. Um, enrollment numbers in rural populations such as New Hampshire and Vermont are still pretty low. Um, and patient and provider roadblocks are one of the most common barriers to participation. So that's why we're here today is to talk to you, what is exactly lung cancer screening? How can you sign up for it? How do you make the decision to screen? What happens when you get your results? And then how can you tell a friend or family member about this? Um, so again, I welcome any questions that you have. Um, hopefully this provided, this entry part provided a little bit of history about lung cancer screening. And now we'll get more into what's involved with the screening, how you make the decision and where you can get screened. So in deciding to screen, I'm sure that raises a lot of questions for individuals that are on this talk. And so they've actually come up with a great website for this um, that you can use in addition to talking with your primary care provider. And the website is pretty easy to remember. It's called shouldiscreen.com, www. And I've printed out some of the pictures that you'll see once you get to that website to help you navigate through. But it first starts with this picture that we see here over on the screen left, which says, we can help you. And you know, it gives you a little outline that they'll talk about why you should screen, what the cost of screening is, which we'll talk a little bit more about in this uh, presentation here, and other things to consider. If you scroll down, you'll get to this point that says, who is eligible for lung cancer screening? And again, this goes over the criteria that I just mentioned. You can see that when it comes to age, they make that same distinction that I just talked about. Whereas if you are Medicare and Medicaid, your coverage goes up to age 77. But if you have private insurance or some other subsidy, you may be covered up until 80 years of age. And most importantly, they have a lung risk calculator um, to help calculate your risk for lung cancer. You'll go through a bunch of questions um, and it really takes about one to two minutes to answer those questions. So it's fairly quick and straightforward, but it will give you a nice handout here um, and tell you what your risk is. So we came up with two different scenarios, one patient that's fairly low risk, which you see on the left, and one patient that's fairly high risk, which you see on the right. But it not only tells you, should you screen, and it gives you some advice on that, but it tells you whether or not you're eligible, it tells you how many people would be saved in your risk category. So if you read that line all the way at the bottom, so for example, with our low risk patients compared to other people like you, three um, fewer deaths will occur out of a thousand people if you get screened. 
versus the higher risk patient, 53 fewer deaths will occur. So it gives you an idea about how much your risk is for getting, getting lung cancer and what your risk is um, in terms of thinking about screening and why you should participate. So that's kind of one of the first steps is should I screen, figuring out whether or not you should screen. And again, we always recommend that you talk with your primary care provider to have them answer any further questions that you have about it as well. And they can help you talk through these things. If you've just made the decision to uh, screen, congratulations. Um, how do you go about doing that? Well, this slide will tell you how. I think first knowing your risk, which we've just talked about and looking at that shouldiscreen.com and seeing what your risk is. I think next, as we've stated, talk to your primary care provider about the benefits and risks of screening. Now, this is a very important point about lung cancer screening that's a little bit different than some of the other screening modalities you may participate in, such as mammograms or colonoscopy. For lung cancer screening specifically, we like for providers to have what we call a shared decision-making conversation with any prospective patient. And that talks about the benefits as well as the risks of lung cancer screening so that you and your provider can make a decision together about whether or not screening is best for you. Um, there's many resources available both in Vermont and New Hampshire to help with this. Here in New Hampshire, we have the Dartmouth-Hitchcock Lung Health and Primary no Pulmonary Nodule Clinic that your provider can either refer you to or that you can self-refer yourself to. And in Vermont, there are many other resources too as well. Um, so if you have any questions about that, we'd be more than happy to answer them. But I think the next step, once you have talked to your provider, follow through with your appointment, make a priority of going to that appointment and getting screened, okay? Talk to your provider about results once you get them, if you have questions. And I think, you know, what's most important is if you don't necessarily meet the criteria, but you have friends and family that do, please tell them about it because they may not have privy to this information. They may not know about screening and you could potentially save their life. Um, in terms of where you can find these, what we call accredited lung cancer screening sites, that means the site has gone through a bunch of different regulatory criteria to make sure that their scanner scans appropriately, that their technologists know how to help get your lung cancer screening CT done, to help the radiologists know how to read your lung cancer screening CT and use that lung reds formula that we talked about before. There were all these sites here, both in New Hampshire as well as in Vermont that you can get screened at what we call those accredited sites. So there are many locations that you can do this at, um, and we hope that you will use one of these. So once you've made the decision, should I screen, and you've gone through the process of having the shared decision-making con conversation with your provider and you've gotten an appointment, what happens when you get screened? Well, let's talk about that, okay? I think first you'll check in just as you do with any other um, appointment that you have at your hospital or primary care clinic. You'll confirm your identity and the test that you're having done. Um, the good thing about this is you do not have to change your clothes. There's no, no needles or injections that are involved and the scan itself is pain free. Um, when it is your turn, you will lay down on the scanning table and the scan takes less than two minutes to perform. They'll ask you to take a deep breath, hold it for as long as you can. You go into the scanner and then you come right out. And then after that, we expect that you will go home and congratulate yourself um, for putting your health first and following through with getting your screening CT. We have some pictures here to show you. Um, the screening modality that we'll be using is the one that's here on the left-hand side, so it's open. It's not the closed donut that's used, to, uh, excuse me, it's not the closed um, system that's used for MRIs, it's open. So you're not in a closed space. And again, it takes less than two minutes, most of the time less than a minute um, for you to go through the scanner. So it's really quick and easy. So once you've gone through that scan, um, how do you get your results? Well, there's a couple of different options. If you are a patient here at Dartmouth-Hitchcock, you can check MyDH. If you are a patient at another facility, then you'll want to check your electronic health records provided by your medical provider. Um, if you do not have access to that, you can call whichever place you get your primary care and they can help you to establish that link. Results will also be mailed to your home address. And so there's patients that will come back and have a negative screening results and patients with a positive screening result. 
It's important to note that if you have a negative screening result, that means that you will come back the next year, okay? However, if you have a positive screening result, meaning that we find something abnormal on your screening study, we will have you come in for an appointment to talk about what the next steps are. And I'm gonna talk about what some of these positive results mean in the next couple of slides, but there are resources available to help with that both here at the Lung Health and Pulmonary Nodule Clinic, as well as there's resources in Vermont at UVM too, as well that you can take advantage of to understand these results. But starting with your primary care provider will also give you information as well. And we don't want you to hesitate in terms of getting those results or discussing them if you don't understand. I think before I go on to this next slide and talk a little bit more about those results, I did want to emphasize, as I said before, if you have a negative result, that still means that you need to come back next year and the year after that until you meet one of these two criteria here at the bottom. Either you have quit using tobacco in terms of cigarettes and your quit date is older than 15 years old, or if you turn the age of 80, and we'd say 77 if you are a Medicare or Medicaid patient, okay? Whichever one of those comes first. But say you do happen to get a positive result, what does that mean? Well, we remember came up with this lung rad system and it's graded into four tiers, lung rad one, two, three, and four, okay? And each of those mean different things. Lung rads one and two means that either your test was normal or you had benign findings and that you'll follow up in one year's time. And your provider or um, the system that you participate in will help you make that follow-up appointment to get your screen the following year. Lung rads three means that we did find something abnormal, but it's probably benign. and means that we should get a repeat scan in six months as opposed to 12 months like you normally would, just so that we can keep a closer eye on this, okay? Lung rads four, if you get that score, that means that we see something that's pretty suspicious. And we are either gonna have you get a CT scan in three months, or we're gonna have you um, have a referral to either our thoracic surgery department or our pulmonary, interventional pulmonary department to, to talk about your further findings. Here at Dartmouth-Hitchcock, we have the Lung Health and Pulmonary Nodule Clinic that manages all of the findings from your screening CT and helps make those referrals for you and plugs you into our system so that you can help get those results, get the follow-up that you need, um, and get going with whatever treatment plan you need if this was to be, um, to be found out to be a cancer. I think, again, though, we can't stress enough please do not be afraid to talk to your provider or talk to one of these programs about your results as soon as you get them. Because we know that with lung cancer, time is of the essence. The whole point of screening is for us to find this early. And the sooner that we can get to you and talk about your results, the sooner that we can get you on to solutions. Okay. This next slide just goes into a little bit more depth about the um, screening uh, levels that we just talked about. But again, just for clarity, if you look at this green chart here, one and two, that means your results are essentially negative and you're going to get an annual screen. Three means you'll need a follow-up in six months as opposed to 12. 4A means you'll need a three-month follow-up. And then 4B or X means that we need to refer you to a specialist and we'll be more than happy to do that. So most importantly, I'm sure most of you are wondering about what are the costs of cancer screening? And here we are to tell you more information about this. I think the good news is, is that each annual exam is covered either by your insurance or Medicare, just like going to the dentist every year, just like your yearly physical, et cetera. And so that you should not have to pay anything for out of pocket, that is considered routine care. And it's important to know that we do that because they know that the screening works and that it helps to find lung cancer early if present. One thing to do is that if you are between the ages of 50 and 64, just check with your primary care provider or your insurance company to make sure that they have adopted these new guidelines. At this point, almost all companies have, but it's always best to just double check that. Now, if we find something suspicious on your CT, for example, if you're in that lung rats three or four category, 
that's when your regular insurance will kick in for any follow-up testing that you need. That is also where your deductible would start if you either haven't received care at all that year or if you're in the process of receiving care and haven't quite met your deductible. So it'd be just like if you go to the dentist and you have your yearly cleaning and an x-ray and then they find a cavity, once they start working on that cavity, then that's when you need to start, your insurance uh, kicks in to start helping to pay for that. The same thing with lung cancer screening. If we find something that's abnormal and you need further workup, that's when your insurance kicks in. Now, if you have any concerns about this or want to know whether or not the insurance that you have would cover this, um, there are many resources in place. For most people in Vermont, you will be covered by Medicare, Medicaid, or private insurance. And if you meet the screening criteria for um, lung cancer screening and you are not covered by that, um, there's other resources available to help get you to that. And we can provide more information for those that need it if you just want to put your um, in, uh, let us know in the chat. OK, most hospitals do have financial assistance programs here to help patients get enrolled in screening programs. So we definitely recommend um, that you contact them to help you get the screening that, that you need. So in summary, you know, just some important things to remember. I think number one, know your risk. So again, if you are between the ages of 50 and 80, if you are either a current tobacco user or you have used tobacco products, specifically cigarettes within the last 15 years, or if you have accumulated a 30, excuse me, 20 pack year history, that's one pack per day for 20 years or the equivalent, then you may be eligible for lung cancer screening. And it's important for you to talk to your provider and see if you are eligible to get screened. We, you know, again, do not hesitate to talk to your provider. The CT itself, it's painless, needle-free, takes less than two minutes to complete once you are in the scanner. Your results will come to you, so please follow those up. There are resources available to help you interpret your results and also help with the costs. But most importantly, lung cancer screening could either save your life or the life of a family or friend. So we encourage you to please, please ask questions. And we are here to answer your questions um, for the remaining time left here. I thank you so much for your attention. And I'll turn it back over uh, to Lisa. Great. Well, Ryan, thank you so much, Dr. Hass. We really appreciate that extensive and accessible presentation. That was really great. So I'm also going to welcome Dr. King. He's joined us. He's had a busy day, so I see that he's popped in, which is great. And Dr. King, as I mentioned earlier, is from UVM. And so Dr. King, it's lovely to see you. He's here as a content expert to help out with a question and answer session. So I did notice um, one question that popped up, which is why are people who quit smoking more than 15 years ago not able to participate? Mm -hmm. That's a great question. And both myself and Dr. King can answer it, but they've done a lot of research on this and they've shown that your risk actually decreases significantly as the years build from the time that you quit. Um, so I always say to patients, it's never too late to quit. Um, I think making that decision has benefits not only in terms of your risk for lung cancer screening, but for many other health diseases such as heart disease, peripheral vascular disease, um, just everything. So they've looked and they've seen that your risk is pretty low once you get to that 15 year point. So at that point, the risk of us actually doing this study and finding something is more than what it would be of you actually participating in the screening. That being said, if you have a significant tobacco history and if you start to develop symptoms such as a new cough, um, chest pain, discomfort, if you have a strong family history, please talk to your provider about that and don't be um, scared to do that or think that just because you're at that 15 point that you can't get lung cancer because you certainly could. It's just that your risk is lower, but it's not zero. So we encourage you to anytime talk to your provider about that and let your family and friends know that too. But that's a great question. I'll turn it over to Dr. King if he has any other further comments as well. I know that sounds like you're right on. That's exactly what I, <laughs> I would say. Um, yeah, just to emphasize the point you made that um, there's a difference between screening and 
look diagnosing lung cancer. So if you do have any symptoms at all, that's that doesn't fall into this category that we're mm -hmm. talking about today. That's actually diagnosis. So definitely see your provider about that so they can assess whether you need a scan or not based on your symptoms. Mm -hmm. I'm going to jump here and in here and say for those UVM patients who do want or are interested in follow-up schedule, uh, scheduling of an appointment at UVM, we've dropped a, a, a link in the chat for those folks who are, again, UVM patients who'd like some follow-up to schedule some follow-up appointments. Again, it's in the link. We'll drop that in the link a few more times before we end as well. That will be leading those UVM patients to um, seeing Dr. King and others at UVM. So I do have some other questions that came in prior to today's session during the registration. I'm wondering if you could talk a little bit about perhaps the downside of screenings, anything that you'd like to share in terms of the risk involved. Yes, so definitely the risks, you know, one of the risks is that we find something or get a false positive. We find something, you get further studies, and then it turns out to not be a cancer. So you may have other, you know, for example, as I said before, if you're, if you, if there's a lung rad scoring system that scores one, two, three, and four. So say, for example, you fall in that lung rads 4A category, where we think it's suspicious and we recommend that you getting a, get a repeat CT scan in three months. We'll say you get that repeat three CT scan in three months, it's still there. Um, and so then we need to start moving to the diagnostic phase where you get a regular CT or a PET scan, which are further imaging um, studies that we have to better identify whether or not this is a cancer and help diagnose it. Um, say we end up needing to get a biopsy for that, but then the biopsy comes back negative. You may have gone down this pathway um, and gotten these extra studies for something that's negative. Um, I always tell people, so that's something that you may have to go through that you wouldn't have gone through if you hadn't participated in lung cancer screening. But on the other hand, you had an abnormality in your chest and we now know for sure what it is or isn't. Um, and so I think, you know, that's one of the dying signs of having to go through extra studies and possibly extra procedures and any complications that could develop from those extra studies or studies or procedures. But I think getting that information can kind of help to offset that risk. I think the costs, especially, um, you know, as I mentioned before, the annual screening CT is free of charge, assuming that you either have Medicare or Medicaid or private insurance to cover that. And again, there are multiple resources to help cover that. If you um, do not have insurance or need help in that area, um, but if we do find something and we need to start um, getting other studies, that is when your insurance comes in. So if you have a large deductible or, or that type of thing, or depending on what type of insurance you have, that is a possible perceived cost that you may have to pay um, potentially out of pocket, for example, for your deductible or um, for the different imaging studies. Again, I would highly recommend that you reach out to both of these centers, both UVM and Dartmouth-Hitchcock, whichever one you are a patient of, to speak with the financial resources that are available and see what is out there. Um, because we really do not want to let financial hindrances prevent you from participating in a program that could potentially save your life. Um, so I would say those are the two most common. I think just the fear of going through the screening process. You know, it's it's when I say on that slide to congratulate yourself once you go through the scan, we're being 100% serious because it takes a lot of courage to go and do something where they may find results that could potentially change your life. But those are also results that are, could potentially save your life. So I think that the little bit of stress that you have, you, that you may go through in terms of doing that study can hopefully be outweighed by either the confidence that you get from getting a negative study and, and being able to move forward, or if you have a positive one, knowing that we're doing our best to catch it early and that we can get you plugged into resources available to help talk with you about different treatments available should this be a cancer um, as soon as possible. Um, I'll turn it over to Dr. King if he has other things to add on that too. Nothing else to add. I would just say that uh, due to the expertise of people like Dr. Hassan, the treatment for lung cancer has gotten much better. And um, if we can catch these cancers earlier, like she said, the treatment is much more effective. Um, so we love the work that you do. <laughs> 
Great. Excellent. Well, thank you so much for those answers. I do have one question for me. Um, I hope you don't mind, but I was very intrigued with the comments about shared decision making. And my understanding is it's a requirement. And I'm wondering if you could elaborate on the process itself, how long it takes and, and probably why it's a requirement and why it's an important step. So maybe if you could provide some more details to us, that would be great. I would love for King answer because he does this all day, every day. <laughs> Um, yes, uh, that is true. The shared decision making is a requirement um, for the screening to be covered by um, by Medicare. And um, basically, it's just a conversation, and we talk about the things that were uh, re represented in Dr. Hassan's slides. Uh, basically, we go through the pros and cons, uh, talk about your individual values uh, related to screening and diagnosis. And then make a decision, and you know, order the test or not based on that. Um, it doesn't take long. It, you know, it, it may be five or eight minutes. Um, um, but it's a, uh, you know, it's a, it's just a conversation with your provider, and um, we make a decision after we talk about it. And what happens if the decision is I can't decide quite yet? Oh and yeah. So come back in for another shared decision making appointment. Perfectly. Uh, yeah, certainly. Um, sometimes you just need more information or you want to do some more uh, searching yourself about it. Um, you know, maybe you want to plug your your own numbers into the should I screen website and see how that see see how that comes out. But certainly it can be a conversation. You don't have to decide right away. Um, you can decide at any point either to screen or not to screen. Okay, great. Thank you. Dr. Hassan, anything from your perspective? with shared decision making. Yeah, no, I agree totally with Dr. King in, in terms of it's a, a conversation of risks and benefits. It doesn't take a long time. I think both of our facilities have resources available too and, and clinics available to help with those conversations. Um, you know, so as a provider, I recommend that you come to those conversations with whatever questions you have. No questions are too big or too small, but the goal of those conversations is for you to walk away as a patient with as much information as we could possibly give you to help make the decision about whether or not screening is right for you. Great, thank you. I think we had one more question from the registration period. Um, someone was curious about the actual process to get screened. Does it take a long time to get an appointment? Maybe that's a difficult question for you all to answer, but um, in, your, in your experience, has, it, has there been a long waiting period before someone was able to get a screening appointment? After they completed their shared decision-making appointment, that is. Yeah, no, I, I would say in general, no, it's, you know, it's a matter, sometimes it can be you know, a month or more, but uh, generally it's something that the, the, all the medical centers that do the screening have access. And you know, obviously they have to, they have to wait, they have to um, put people and schedule them and you do have to go to the medical center to get the, um, the test done. But in general, it's not a, a long wait. Okay, great. Thank you. Dr. Hassan, anything to uh, yeah, no, I, I would agree with that. There's a lot of different places that you can get screened. We saw over 20 locations on those two slides between New Hampshire and Vermont. So if there is possibly a longer wait at one place versus another, you may just want to ask and see what the wait is at different places so that you can get in as soon as you uh, possibly could. And I believe you could also be screened at UVM's Medical Center main campus too, which wasn't on the map for Vermont, but I believe Dr. Sigmund added that to the comments for everyone to to hear about too. Um, I'm gonna to throw it open and ask Reggie or Rachel if they've seen any other comments coming in or from the chat or Reggie, when you were registering people, I'm wondering if there are any comments or questions that you'd like to share. Yeah, I just posted it in chat. There was um, the question that the public all, always hears about colonoscopies and mammograms and skin checks as a routine part of healthcare for adults. This was the first time I heard about lung cancer screenings. Is this new or has it been around a while? Or um, the follow-up question was, um, is this new to this area? Mm -hmm. I think, you know, lung cancer screening isn't new. It's about 10 years old. Um, you know, it, it's, 
it's taken a while for us to gain traction in terms of getting patients enrolled in lung cancer screening is the unfortunate part. And it's unfortunate because it's been shown to be so beneficial for patients that are eligible. Um, it's been around for about 10 years, but nationwide, um, the uptake or those that participate in it is only about 6% of the eligible population. Now I will say here in Vermont, we actually do a bit better and we're between 11 and 15% in terms of the eligible population that participates, but we also have a larger population that um, uses tobacco products and we have a higher incidence of lung cancer within um, Vermont and New Hampshire. So our pool from which we're pulling from is a bit bigger, um, but it's why we're doing forums like these is to help raise awareness, help patients to understand how quick and easy it is to participate, the extreme benefits of it and that it could save your life and that, you know, that it's becoming more and more accessible now. They've, we've actually, in my lab, we've done some research on this and they've, you know, multiplied the number of accredited sites pretty significantly over the past 10 years. But in terms of getting patients enrolled, you know, more efforts like these are needed to help spread the word. I'll, I'll turn it over to Dr. King. See if he has yeah, I, I agree with that completely. Um, and, and I think it's sort of gradually becoming more acceptable, like you said, and more widespread. Another thing that's happened just in the last few years is um, the research has supported screening people who have a, a less lesser amount of smoking history. Um, the original, as, as Dr. Hassan had pointed out in her talk, was 30 pack years, but that's been now dropped down to 20 pack years because they found that, you know, those people who had had 20 pack years were also at high risk for cancer. So that's been a change and it, it increases the number of people that um, we need to talk about the screening. Excellent. Well, I think we're coming up to the end of our session. Uh, again, I just wanted to point out a few reminders. If you're a UVM patient, you could, um, and wanted a follow-up appointment, please click the link, which has been provided in the chat. If for whatever reason you happen to have questions after you leave, please do get in touch with us. We'd love to um, match you with the, the source, the that would be able to provide the answers to your questions. And that person um, would be Regina Ann Cooper. She's provided her email address in the chat as well. Um, so I just wanted to end by saying thank you so much, Dr. Hassan and Dr. King for this session. It's just been so informative. I hope it's helped our participants as well. I also want to thank Reggie Cooper and Rachel Nakowitz for it taking care of everything behind the scenes and making sure that this went off smoothly. We really appreciate all of your efforts. And again, if you have any questions, please do let us know. And I think that concludes our session for the day. And thank you so much. We appreciate your time. Thank you. Everyone. Bye everyone. Thank you. Bye-bye. Thank you so much.